Hey guys, Rich from Rich McGaming. Hope everybody's doing fantastically well. In this video, we're going to take a look at 11 rules in Marvel Crisis Protocol that can sometimes trip up even the most seasoned of Wargamer out there. But before we get into that, guys, go down and hit that subscribe button. Almost 65% of you watching these videos are still not subscribed. That means you're not eligible to join our giveaway for the month of June. So make sure you go down there and hit that subscribe button. Now let's get into it. So let's start off with one of the rules that I think causes the most problems for players coming from other games into Marvel Crisis Protocol, and that is the rules around cover and line of sight. Everything in Marvel Crisis Protocol has a size, whether it be a character or a piece of terrain. Now to find a character size, you can look on their character card, and to find the size of a piece of terrain, you can look underneath if it is a official piece of Marvel Crisis Protocol terrain, or follow these recommendations here and agree with your opponent beforehand what size everything will be. Now, irrespective of the physical height of the terrain or the character, we always use these sizes when we're establishing line of sight. Here we can see Luke Cage, who is size two, and Lockjaw, who is size three, either side of Deadpool's taco truck, which is also size three. As Luke is a smaller size than the taco truck, and you cannot draw a straight line from Lockjaw's base without hitting the truck, Lockjaw does not have line of sight to Luke and therefore cannot target him. As Lockjaw is however the same size as the taco truck, remembering that the physical height of something is irrelevant in this game, Luke can draw a line of sight to Lockjaw and target him. It's also worth noting here that if a character is stood atop a piece of terrain for determining line of sight, its size becomes that of itself, plus the terrain they are standing on. Also worth noting is that no characters block line of sight, enemy or otherwise, and there are some attacks that ignore line of sight, but these will clearly be marked on the card and are an exception to the rule. So, on to cover next, and firstly, what are the benefits of cover? Well, quite simply, cover allows you to modify one of your dice into a block. Now, remember that you need a dice to be able to do this, so if you've rolled five defense dice and all five are blocks, you're not going to get anything extra from cover. And also, if your only remaining dice is a failure, you cannot modify that dice. Well, the most common way to achieve cover is from terrain, so let's jump back over to our example and take a quick look. So Luke Cage targets Lockjaw with a Sweet Christmas, which is a range 3 attack. We know Luke can draw a line of sight to Lockjaw, but Lockjaw is within one of the taco truck. He will therefore gain cover from the attack, allowing him to modify one of his defense dice to a block. Let's now say, however, that Luke Cage is still the other side of the taco truck and wants to use Power Man Punch. Even though Lockjaw is still within one of the cover, Luke is now within range two of the bestest boy, so loses his cover. Once again, there are some exceptions to the rule of two, Magneto's Magnetic Refraction card and Rocket's Small Stature, both state they always benefit from cover, so whether you're in range two or not, they would still get to modify their dice. Each character gets to make up to two actions during their turn. That doesn't, however, mean that they can only do two things during this activation. Interacting with objectives and tokens, playing tactics cards and performing superpowers do not use up any of the character's action points. As with everything else in Marvel Crisis Protocol, there are always some exceptions, so superpowers such as Thor's for Asgard and Green Goblin's Hit and Run, but these are quite clearly shown on the character card and are once again exceptions to the rule. Another thing to note with tactic cards is whilst some of them, such as Magneto's Magnetic Crush, give you access to that attack, it still costs an action point to spend that attack itself. However, fill your boots with Wakanda Forever and Avengers Assemble. Okay, so this next one captures out a lot of people and is probably the rule that I've had to explain the most whilst playing games, not only with new players, but even with some more veteran players. And it is that bleed is not an enemy effect. Whilst it's applied by an enemy, when we're taking into consideration gaining power and taking damage, it is not included as an enemy effect. This means that if your character has bleed and takes the damage at the end of his activation, they're not going to gain a power from it. Equally, if you're playing somebody like Thanos, who has the ability to reduce all enemy damage by one, 
it's still not going to apply because of that keyword enemy damage. Crossbones' Inert to Pain, however, does not specify enemy damage, so he can spend one power to negate the effects of bleed. Another one then that catches out a lot of new players is exploding crits. You only get to do them once, and it's the first thing that happens after both characters have rolled their dice pulls. Crits rolled from either previously exploded crits or from re-rolls do not allow you to add additional dice into your dice pool. So pre-measuring is something we see implemented across many games in many, many different guises to the point where you'll see some players playing games with four or five tape measures trying to work out whether they can make a string of movements and attacks and make it work. And whilst we do allow pre-measuring in Marvel Crisis Protocol, there's really only one rule, and that is you can have one measurement tool and one range tool on the table at any one time. Some movement effects, typically pushes and throws, may have the keywords away or towards included in the description. In this case, it limits the direction that characters can be pushed or thrown, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. Firstly, let's look at a throw away from Thanos onto Luke Cage. We first need to establish what direction away is, and to do this we draw a straight line, ignoring other characters or terrain, from the centre of Thanos' base to the centre of Luke's base. We then take a measurement tool and bend it to form a 90 degree angle, with its pivot point centred on the line and placed up to Luke's base between him and Thanos. Thanos can now throw Luke short anywhere within the 90 degree arc created by the range tool, but having to ensure that Luke's base never goes outside that 90 degree arc. It's also important to note that when throwing a character, it has to be thrown the full distance, However, it will stop if it collides with a piece of terrain or any other character. So now we know how to throw away, it's really easy to explain a push towards. Here we see Spider-Man using web line against Luke Cage. We draw the same line from the centre of each character's base, bend a movement tool to 90 degrees, but this time place it at the opposite side of Luke's base, again ensuring that the pivot point passes through our imaginary line. We can then move Luke in any direction, ensuring that it does not cross either arm of the movement tool, and once again the character must be pushed the full distance, with them stopping if they collide with any characters or terrain. Some characters, whether it be via superpowers, triggers from attacks, or even tactics cards, have the ability to throw enemy characters or terrain. When measuring how far you throw an enemy character, you always measure from that character's base. However, when throwing a piece of terrain, you always measure from the character who is doing the throwing. Yes, if you have more than one ability that triggers after damage is dealt, for example, you as the controlling player of that character get to choose which order to resolve these in. The best, most recent, and probably craziest version of this at the moment is the Braid Bash attack from Medusa which allows her to push her opponent short if she deals damage, but also if she rolls a wild, triggers flurry, allowing her to do the same attack again. But because as the controlling player you get to choose which order to resolve these two triggers, you can follow up straight away with another attack, and then if you do more damage, push that character away small twice. A rule that's been around since the beginning of the game, but we're seeing pop up more and more often now on newer characters, is the ability to stop your opponent from modifying their dice. But what does this actually cover? Well, this is where it can get a little bit tricky, as there are a lot of abilities out there that at first glance look like dice modification, but are actually not included. Rerolling of dice from any source is completely out, as is cover, which is a modification of dice which we covered earlier. It also negates any abilities such as Captain Marvel's energy absorption that state the word change on the ability. However, abilities such as Martial Artist, allowing you to count blanks as successes, or the Reality Gem that allows you to treat one failure as a crit, are not classed as modifying dice and are therefore not negated by such abilities. Terrain plays a huge part in Marvel Crisis Protocol, whether you're using it as a weapon or gaining cover from it, and whilst all terrain in Marvel Crisis Protocol is technically destroyable, there are a few rules around it. If you pick up a piece of terrain and throw it into your enemy, irrespective of the size, that terrain is always destroyed. If you pick up a piece of terrain and throw it into another piece of terrain, 
Brotherhood players out there will know what I'm talking about. As long as the terrain you've thrown is the same size or smaller than the terrain you're throwing it into, both pieces of terrain are destroyed. If, however, you throw a character into a piece of terrain, the terrain is only destroyed if the character is larger than the terrain you're throwing them into. So a size 2 loot cage would not destroy a size 2 dumpster. Lastly then is timing, and with all of these new characters being brought into the game that bring options with them to modify and re-roll not only their own dice, but other characters' dice and opponents' dice as well, it can sometimes be really confusing as to what order you should resolve each of these abilities in. So let's take a quick look at an example again. So Luke is once again back in the thick of things, this time coming up against everyone's favourite big-headed maniac, Murdoch. Luke declares that he is going to perform a sweet Christmas into Murdoch, and using the rules we covered before, establishes that he does have line of sight, but as he is outside of range 2, Murdoch will benefit from cover. He pays 4 power for the attack, and forms his dice pool, adding dice equal to the strength shown on the attack, which in this case is 7. As this is a physical attack, Murdoch forms his dice pool of only 2 dice, as indicated by his defensive stats. Luke rolls his 7 dice, managing 1 hit, 3 wilds, 1 crit, and a blank and a failure. Murdoch then rolls his 2 defense dice, rolling a hit and a blank. Luke then explodes his crit, adding 1 additional dice to his pool and rolling 1 additional hit. Murdoch has no crits to explode, so it's on to the modification stage. Luke has no modifiers he can call upon himself, but as he is currently playing in the X-Force with Cable as his leader, he gets to re-roll one attack dice. He re-rolls his blank, but isn't able to add any more successors to his attack. Next to modify his own dice is Murdoch, and he chooses to spend one power for P-Brain and re-rolls one dice. He manages to roll a crit, and whilst it will count as a block for Murdoch, it will not allow him to add any more dice into his dice pool. As Murdoch also has cover, he now modifies one dice to a block, in this case giving him two blocks in total. Next up we modify our opponent's dice and always starting with the attacker, so Luke goes first and applies any modifications to Murdoch's dice pool, but as he has no such abilities it passes over to Murdoch. Murdoch using his psionic force field changes all of the wilds rolled by Luke into blanks, giving Luke three successes in total to Murdoch's two, and applying a damage of 1. Before this damage is applied however, we need to ensure there are no effects from either the attacker or defender that happen before damage is dealt. In this case there is not, so we apply the damage, with Murdoch taking the damage and gaining 1 power. We then resolve any effects that happen after the attack. Now even though Luke rolled 3 wilds, he does not trigger his throw as Murdoch changed these to blanks, but he does get to apply the slow and stun special conditions onto Murdoch. Murdoch has no effects to resolve, nor is anything applied from the crisis cards, so the action is over. And there we go guys, they are my 11 rules that players, new and old, seem to get wrong or ask for in forums time and time and time again. So hopefully you found that useful. Remember that we have the giveaway going for the month of June where you need to be subscribed and leave a comment down on this or any other video released in the month of June to be in with a chance to win a brand new character pack. And it leaves me with just enough time as always to say stay well, keep safe, and until next time, bye for now.